are listening to the Friends Week Party for the first week of June 2021. This week, the party attempt to figure out why RPGs give magic a free pass. But we don't have a spell for it, so it'll probably fail. The Event Week Party, discussing tabletop and radio gaming the Irish way. Welcome to the party. I'm Owen. I'm Liam. And I'm Shane. And today, we are here to discuss what could be called the realism fallacy. And what do I mean by the realism fallacy? I mean the bit where you as the rogue go, I want to sneak past this guy. And the GM goes, what? You want? I want to sneak past this guy, this guard. I'm going to sneak past him. I'm going to use my my nod of stealth and that box over there and roll behind that wall and move where he just turns a little bit and sneak around. The GM goes, that's impossible. It's too hard. You can't just move through in plain sight. That's ridiculous. And the wizard then goes, oh, GM, I'm going to cast invisibility. And the GM goes, oh, of course that works. That's simple. That's magic. Oh, yes. Oh, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous that you think it wouldn't work. So a little bit of a difficulty that arises between the game as a simulation of reality and the game as a bunch of effects that a player might pursue to achieve a goal. So... Re, uh, simulation-based versus effects-based model of both game design and interpretation by the GM at the table. Thoughts, guys? Well, I mean, for me, I guess the, the first thing that jumps out is that a lot of the times magic gets a bit of leeway because the rogue can sneak every round for the entire day, uh, every round of every minute for the entire day, whereas the wizard only has so many spell slots. And that spell slot can be occupied by a lot of different things so they have to have been either have their spell list be flexible enough or perhaps burn a resource to use it like taking a scroll to do that kind of thing um i think that's why some of it has that leeway because they're consuming a finite resource what about the cases where it's effectively an infinite resource a cantrip or you've got a refund of powerpoints or regular regen or something like that that's where there's a bit of a difficulty. And you can have, sometimes you can have that, okay, well, you know, the, the rogue will be able to use their thievery to, you know, stick a wedge in behind the door and knock the bar up or something like that, or, or you know, use a coat hanger or a rope or something to remove the bar. But your open lock spell doesn't cover a door being barred. You know, there, sometimes there can be limits put on, on that kind of thing. But yeah, it's a bigger discrepancy, much bigger discrepancy when it's not a finite resource. Like they, I think the use, the use of the invisibility spell is, is is quite similar in that. Okay, you cast invisibility, well, it, it's it's cast and then it's gone and it lasts for whatever level a minute, and that's your use for it for the day, unless you're a sorcerer and want to use all your spell slots for it. But still, it's a finite thing where the rogue could, in theory, sneak every again, hide every minute of of the day. But is that like a real thing that happens, or is it the number of times a rogue sneaks in reality? is actually probably only going to be, yeah, two or three times a day. How often does it come up, yeah? Unless the rogue is in perma-sneak mode. Well, uh, that can depend on the game. Like, I mean, some games, like, the, the rogue has to get either a flank or a sneak to, to try and get their sneak attack off, which is where all their damage is coming from. So they're going to be doing it all the time. Whereas in other games, they might have a different ability. Maybe they, you know, they have to, they just need an ally to be near them as opposed to full-on flanking. Maybe there's less of an emphasis on them hiding. Other than that, yeah, in your average mission, how often does a rogue guide? Not that often. Shane, any thoughts? Uh, I, I do think that there's some uh, uh, merit to what uh, Liam is arguing. Oh, I think that maybe the point that, yeah, just because someone can hide for free uh, any number of times a day doesn't mean it actually happens. And very often, like, there's not zero effort in setting up a skill role. You generally have to put in, the player has to put in about more mental effort to order to position themselves in the narrative and plan out their approach. Is there some furniture and stuff around there that can tuck in behind? And, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. So it's like, I think it's maybe a, a disconnect between the amount of in-game effort that's being done to uh, achieve an effect where the 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 wizard is marking off a spell scroll or has invested in this uh, cantrip or whatever. Whereas out of game, the the player of the rogue is possibly the one who's putting in more effort, and yeah, you know, that I think is maybe what is is um, 
causing the disconnect here or 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 is the the symptom of the disconnect here it's just like what are we valuing are we valuing the uh the the efforts of the player or the numbers of the character sheet but what about straight disallow like a rogue goes can i sneak in there and the gm goes no it's impossible to sneak in there and a wizard goes can i turn invisible and walk in there and the gm goes yeah that works like what about that where basically as the rogue player whose focus is probably more on the stealth end and the sneaking around end than the wizard who also gets gas fireball basically gets to go oh yeah i just yeah, you just you, you can't do that i as a wizard can do that i will walk in here and do that thing like what do you do then there's a serious disconnect if, if that is that they can do that like i say they can there's no limit on that there's no finite resource being consumed that's definitely problematic yeah. uh if now, if there is a finite resource being consumed, yeah, it's it's supposed to be a little unfair. But you can make an argument that narrative positioning is in itself a resource, so something that takes effort to build up and then utilize and as a justification for your skill role. I'll give you another example, a different example, away from visibility and rogues. I was in an argument this week about the uh, in Wolfrup, certain weapons have the entangling quality where if you hit with them you get the entangle condition and you can't move until you break out of the entangle so one of the examples is a whip so if you hit someone with a whip it's an entangling weapon they are entangled they can't move until they break out of your whip that's the thing and uh, one of someone would say this is ridiculous shouldn't work like this let's say you hit someone with a whip they could just move forward. I wouldn't let uh, the whip inflict the entangling condition or I would basically let anyone who thinks about it to break out of it really easily. And I said, well, what about the entangle spell? And he goes, what do you mean? And he goes, why does that get to entangle people which just literally inflicts entangle conditions as well versus a whip which inflicts entangle conditions? It's nearly as hard to hit someone with a weapon as it is to cast a spell at certain points in Wuffrup. So why are you saying that it's ridiculous for a whip to be able to entangle somebody and the spell isn't. I said, you could catch a leg, you could catch two legs. You go, oh, if you caught two legs, you just pull the guy over. That'd be, and it doesn't do that. So it can't be like that. So there's definitely a double standard there. Like, and a lot of GMs and a lot of players will look at this as a total double standard. Oh, you can't possibly do that realistically. Uh, You know, I can't imagine how you could do it. Like, this is the guy saying you couldn't use a weapon cord to flip a weapon back into your hand because I tried to do it with my mouse and keep uh, with my mouse. Uh, to flip my mouse in my hand. I was like, <laughs> you're not a trained... Sort of Your mouse sort of isn't a finely balanced implement. Yeah, it's like, so there's a, a hu- there is a huge issue that magic often gets a hand wave because hey, you can do it. Other stuff doesn't. Another example, computer hacking. Let's say your GM doesn't know a lot about computers, which often happens. And you go, you're in a cyberpunk game, you go, can I hack this to get the password? And he goes, yeah, sure. Roll. And then Liam's your next GM, and he goes, can I like this to get the password? He's like, what are you talking about? Well, the first the first thing you want to roll for is, is your idi- is your user an idiot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you check under their keyboard? Yeah. <laughs> did you che- check in their, did you go to their thing and look for the bit of paper marked password, or the little black book with all their passwords in it? I, I, I spent a summer working in IT in the city council, and literally, like people were requested to leave their, their their desktop machines off so that we could log into them. But you know, kind of the policy was that if it was on, you you know, you you, you try to save to save any work that was there or whatever, and and you could literally, like, I honestly could get into fifty percent of machines by just guessing the password. This person, this person has Arsenal stuff on their desk. Arsenal one two three. <laughs> Shocking, like. <laughs> I mean, like a chunk of that can be can fall down to the the, the the thing which I think we've discussed a couple of times of like if if somebody's really into mountaineering, then suddenly you're not making athletics checks to climb up this wall. There's like five different skills for spelunking and you know abseiling and everything. You know, it, there's there is just a, there is a disparity there. It can be kind of weird as well, depending on the level, because. Again, thinking of the example of Wolfrup is, yeah, okay, it starts off being pretty comparable to try and entangle somebody by casting the spell and by making an attack. But typically, as you go up, casting spells gets easier because you get things like instinctive dictions, which which gives you automatic successes and stuff, versus 
the bad guys, often their weapon skill and their ability to counter you attacking them with a weapon gets even harder. So you get it that you have that maybe it's comparable at the start, but as things expand out, it gets totally, totally out of whack. Like, there's a mechanical side of it, but I do think the sort of mental block of, like, I don't know how magic works, so I just yeah. sort of defer to what the spell says happens rather than does it make sense in the, the setting or fiction for it to work that easily. I mean, I guess the, the, the thing is, like, you have to be fair to your players, though. Because it's like it's the tough balance between okay, well you have to be fair to the wizard who's taken open lock, but then what if you have a follower of Ronald in your party who's all like I want to focus on on being able to pick locks and stuff, and I, I think you really you probably need to address it by bumping up the other guy, but then you end up with all sorts of disparities in your system, you know. From a mechanics end, I often look at it a bit like a color pie in Magic, where you maybe should have a situation where, look, if you're going to do like a rogue character, they should have access to all of the open lock sneak and stabbing people in the back skills pretty well. And if you slide over to the wizard who's got access to maybe that, a bit of that, but also a bit of AOE and a bit of killing people, uh, there, if there's an overlap, it should be well. Like, which guy is really doing this, uh, having to invest more to do this? And it's really, you should probably be going, well, like the rogue should at least be as good as sneaking around as a wizard who can turn invisible. As much as that might rankle. And you go, that's, that's not realistic. It's like, yeah, but people have to play the game. And if the if the rogue solution to, you know, I'm not being allowed to rogue. I'm going to re-roll as a wizard with a bunch of uh, rogue spells and just be a better rogue that way. Which is the origin of a lot of the issues in early 3.5 where you were just better off being a wizard most of the time and doing uh, to be a rogue how many times you're gonna have to open lock in a dungeon well i prepped four knocks i think we'll be fine and i've got this wand of knock as well you know so both game designers and gms need to be a little more uh forgiving of certain implementations otherwise if i want to be a thief i want to be a thief in wolfrup i would be either a, a gray wizard or a priest of renald because they can both, they can, a priest of Renal can do, you can't see me, right? And no one can see you. Or they can open locks. You know, it's basically like, this is way easier than doing all the other stuff. Just do the magic thing. I mean, the, the, the simplest hack with Warfrup is basically, I mean, the most basic one is just to say, you have to hit the same difficulty numbers and the same success levels as somebody picking a lock when you cast that spell. Now, it's not really a long-term fix because again a lot of spellcasters have stuff that will give them automatic successes and things like that and they're not per spell they apply to all of their spells so even in that ongoing arms race they will win you know i, I think it at a low level it's a basic fix yeah but it's like it's, it's a huge issue with there's a conflict between the verisimilitude which wizards are really dangerous and very capable in the setting and a regular thief but at the play table, if you'd say that, everyone's going to say, can I just not play a wizard then? Because this is just way better, way better value. It's a bit like Jedi in Star Wars, where you're like, are Jedi more powerful and dangerous than regular people? And the answer is yes. There's almost, if you look at the films, there's almost no characters who can stand up to a Jedi in a fight. And a Jedi have a ton of pr- powers for solving outside context problems. If you look at it from purely a... What I want the most bang for my book out of my character, you pick a Jedi every time, right? And you, often the games kind of bear that out, where it's like, yeah, being a Jedi is better. You end up, if you look at the fiction, you'll go, the fiction will provide you ample examples of how that's right. So, yeah, like, you know, what the, there is a, a point where the game designer has to say, actually, we've got to give some space for the other characters to do stuff, to give their reason why you bring along these other characters. And the GM has to give a little bit more leeway maybe to the other characters who have a little less raw power to do the stuff that they should be doing. Well, I guess it's, it's down to is, I mean, is, is game balance the most important part or is narrative balance and, and kind of gameplay balance more important as well? Because like there are games that just straight up, like say with Star Wars where Jedi can just be better. And if I think back to playing a player's magic, Wizards are just straight up better than everybody else. Now, 
the way you do that is you, you just balance it out narratively. And also wizards tend to be, you rock them to a town as a wizard and they're like, holy crap, let's burn them. You know, you, you, you can't really balance that out. You, you have to balance that out with the, the social and overall world stuff. In Irish Magic, it's, isn't there a bit of troop play aspect to it where you have like a wizard character? You've There's got, a like, troop uh, play. Yeah. Yeah, and generally you want to send a mix of people out into the world. You might send your wizard, you might send, and then there might be a couple of people playing the companion characters and you have the grog and stuff like that as well, like just a shield, shield carrying dude to give you a bit of a buffer. So that, like, that naturally has a bit of a narrative balance going on as well, you know? But I definitely think magic gets off too easy. A little bit of, oh, it's magic. It's, it, should, it should be allowed, you know, kind of ignore the rules a bit more. And yeah, if it's heavily costed, but it often isn't. Like, if you look at it, it's often like, no, this isn't really a lot worse, you know? This is a little worse, but not so much worse that, you know, I'd feel bad or I feel like I'm really paying a lot for it. The question again of, is is a, is a rogue hiding every round, or is he, or is the rogue hiding, like, two or three times in a dungeon? Is a, it's a relevant question. There's also this sort of disconnect between how powerful is he first-level character compared to a commoner? And... Very often, a game will claim, say, "Oh, first level character is even at this low level is an exceptional example of their uh, of their profession, etc., etc." And then, like, yeah, they have like plus one or plus two over what a uh, what a regular person or town guard would do, and it's just like I, I think uh, it's, you know, not that I'm that big on on, on sports or anything like that, but uh, I think you're when you're first level, you're basically the best player in a Sunday league team. <laughs> <laughs> It might be exceptional for that team, but if you go on to go, go, go on to that in serious, they'll run rings around you. A junior B all star. <laughs> Played into county at under sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's just sort of the thing. Is is just like very often it doesn't feel so much like you're an exceptional thing because like you're only getting like a point or two above what uh, an ordinary schlub on the street is. But like the wizard, even if their stats are very common or esque will still have this ability to do amazing things and very often those amazing things have very explicit written out rules that don't really need a lot of interpretation but i mean if you look at like most fantasy worlds where where you have wizards and druids and all that kind of stuff like they, they have there are people in the village you know there might be a, a priest and an acolyte uh in the local temple that can cast cure like wounds and stuff and there might be a you know a wise woman who can create some potions and you know the, the, there tends to be a few people out there who have similar kind of abilities. So you're not even that exceptional. Now you might be that there's only a handful of people in the village, therefore you are relatively exceptional anyway. But I mean, there's not that many people out there in a the medieval village you'd be able to put horseshoes together. I keep thinking of like the Dragonlance problem, where in the fiction the the characters in Dragonlance are supposed to be first level characters, but in the books, they're presented as if they're these veterans. They're fifth. They're they're fourth or fifth in the books, aren't they? Because I know Rastelin is hitting people with second level spells fairly early on, and he gets fireball kind of towards the end of book one, book two, sort of book two, I think. So they're not they're not really low level. But the adventure that they are on is the first level adventure. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be that surprised anyway, because it is a classic trope of the genre, isn't it? You know. <laughs> Veteran of these wars, first level, <laughs> greatest gladiator in the arena, first level. <laughs> well, to a certain extent, any level based game is as that sort of aesthetics to it. You know, it's kind of like, well, you know, this is how the world works. Is that how the world works? It's complicated. You know, that's one of the things about uh, one of the wizards, the iconic wizard in Pathfinder is in his 50s. And everyone thinks, oh my god, he must be an archbishop. He's like, no, I I, I started late. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I only I, I only could have retrained in my late 40s, so uh, I'm still <laughs> learning, you know? But hey, he gets 20 by the end, you know? Yeah, yeah. I guess that's something that I, I, I guess I kind of thought of because I mentioned the, the, the acolytes and potions and stuff, but um, medical healing is another one where yeah. they tend to go, well, okay, yeah, well, you're 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 a cleric so yeah okay somebody just heals 20 hit points whereas okay i want to treat these runes oh you have to spend 10 minutes doing it and they'll get a d8 back they'll, they'll be back to, back to full in three to four weeks of uh bed rest and you can only do it once a day or something you know almost no game does accurate healing yeah 
Well, I mean, almost no game does accurate damage. So if you're not doing accurate damage, you can't do accurate healing. No, no one does. Oh, that's your knee. F- what is that fixed? Well, a couple of months of physio, uh, and then surgery, and then some more surgery, and then a couple of months of physio get you back to eighty percent probably. What? You dislocated your kneecap, man. I, I don't know what to tell you. You know, you tore a bunch of ligaments. You yeah. tore some tendons. Uh, you're you, basically... You got stabbed. We had to remove your gallbladder. You, you yeah. kind of have lifelong complications from this. But no, you know, like... Because RPGs, ultimately... If you start yourself going, oh, we're, this RPG is really realistic, I'm like, no, it's not. You know, do people get tired fighting for a long period of time? What? Do they get tired fighting for more than a minute? Like, I, anyone could fight for a minute. Like, you have never, clearly never fought for a minute. Try fighting for a minute all out for a little bit and see how tired you feel at the end of it. Like, you can fight for a while if you're doing a very specific kind of warfare where you're poking people with a, a, a long spear and just trying not to get stabbed in the face of the shield. But that's like, that's that, that, took, that took them thousands of years to figure out how to yeah. uh, do that. Try grappling with someone for a minute. When you both know what you're doing, try that for a minute and see how tired you get. You know, you would be shocked how fast you run out of puff. That stamina bar in Dark Souls doesn't look so unrealistic now. I haven't played both offensive and defensive line in American football. I can confirm that that is very tiring. <laughs> you're glad that play's only going for 10, 15 seconds. And that's the, that's the, so, I mean, when we start talking about all oh, realism is an excuse for something not to do it, RPGs are profoundly unrealistic. They are an abstraction of the real world, and a little bit of that abstraction should be given the benefit of the doubt of the characters who don't have a hand wave like magic, which are often led away with a lot of stuff that really other stuff could get the same hand wave, and you wouldn't become profoundly unrealistic. Yeah, I, I get that, and you know, it is it is a, it is something that we should probably keep in mind, but. There's also sort of a set of genre expectations that I feel like things. This is it's like, let's say you have a you let people, and do their skills and their skills at a certain point they can do, these crazy things that people say are unrealistic. For example, like you know the the rogue can just you know move between blinks or whatever, and people are saying, well, I was expecting a more grounded game, and it's just like. Are we changing genre now? It's just like, I, I thought we were supposed to be, you know, dirt farmers trying our hand at robbing a dungeon. But now now we're apparently, you know, like ninjas out of a terrible kung fu movie. Let's say I said, I want to hop up that wall. And your GM goes, it's a 30 foot wall with no real handholds. That's impossible. And I went on to Google and I pulled out an image of a parkour thing where someone does exactly the same thing. It looks impossible because you don't know the techniques that make it doable. There's a lot of stuff like that. Like someone like, like I was looking up man catchers and I thought, my God, these things must be nearly impossible to use. And I watched people use them. I said, oh no, this is really simple when you know what you're doing and incredibly effective when you know what you're doing. These should be really powerful. Because it's often like, oh, this should be really difficult to, to grapple and grab someone. Nope. Designed right. These are really simple. They're effectively spring-loaded based on the curved power of metal. And you just click it on. And now you're in control of this person. Ooh, 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 ooh. And it's... There's a lot of stuff that we think of as really hard or unrealistic. Because we haven't done it. Like if you... Uh, like some people will say things. Like very occasionally they say this by teaching. Oh, I couldn't do that. And I find it easy talking in front of 30 people. It's really easy to keep their attention. It's really easy to do other stuff because I know a bunch of tricks about how you do it that aren't necessarily easy to explain. Or I know stuff about using computers that other people are oh, that's impossible. Go, no, it's easy. You just use this program and this program and this program and it works together properly. Audio editing. I bet that's nearly impossible. Pfft, no. you know, It's all down to what skills you have access to. So you have to be very careful about saying, oh, something's not realistic. It's like broaden your horizons a little bit. You might find the things that you think of as being incredibly hard actually aren't, you know? Misdirection's easier than we think. Do you remember the video where they have the ball pass back and forth between five or six people and nobody notices the panda? <laughs> yeah. The moonwalking bear. 
Maybe things are a bit easier to do when you know how to do them. They're not quite as hard as everyone thinks. Yeah, I, I guess. I, I certainly th- I certainly would put myself on the side of we should let skilled characters do amazing and maybe even supernatural things uh, with, uh, with, with, with skills. If the, I guess uh, there's also, there could also be the element of the crit fisher. I mean, they're, they're can I think that the reticence, I think a lot of the times about it though, is like, okay, I sneak into the command tent and I grab all the plans. Great. Cool. Then let's get out of here. The GM's like, well, there's my two hours of prep down this money. Social skills is another good example. Oh, yeah. You might go, that's impossible for you to achieve that. And I think if you actually look at people who are really good at manipulating people, it's actually not that hard. They go in, they say the right thing to the right person in the right way with the right presentation for themselves, and it's actually really easy. I mean, in the early days of the adventuring party, at least half of the party had bought those uh, those dice with their really square edges. Yeah. What are they called? Science dice. That's the ones. I was like, these just looked like they got diced and just didn't process them. (laughs) I mean, that that one's got a sprue mark on the edge. (laughs) You guys got (laughs) hoodwinks. I once, uh, I had an assignment due in university once and uh, the building had closed early due to renovation work. I grabbed a hard hat and a yellow jacket, picked up a bag of cement and walked in and delivered my assignment that way. That's. I mean, I, 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 I'm aware that, that that is possible, but um, wow, that's that's like a get shut down, and those guys could get in serious trouble if there happened to have been a HSA, HSA inspector around. <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I was just late. I was like, oh, I need to do this qu- quick, you know. Do, do, do you have a safe pass? <laughs> Got in there, no problem. So, you know. Yeah. I, I did the safe pass course. It boils down to don't walk behind the blind side of a digger. <laughs> Do we think that this is something that should all be GM, or do you think that games should put more effort? Like, presumably in this case of a game which is already unconsciously biased against, well, what happens when someone rolls a 20 on their sneak? Uh, can they just blink past the guard? I mean, really, as a GM, you can only really kind of sand things off. Like, you know, you're, you, you have a system, you've decided you're going to play the system, and suddenly there's massive holes in it. Like, what? You know, how much of your game do you want to be about plugging the holes? I think that a good game design pass should go, okay, just let's check something. Build the best stealth wizard you can. Build the best stealth regular character you can with the same amount of resources. Let's check their capabilities. Oh, the stealth wizard could do a lot more. Let's put in a few abilities that add justification for like a once per scene or once per session the uh this rogue player can do x and maybe you just go replicate the effect of invisibility if you're lazy if you're a bit more creative you'll put their own spin that they can do this or do this you know and you actually put you put a little bit of effort into going or in the gm advice give space for characters with a focus and a skill to have a little bit of spotlight time and do something cool with their sneaking abilities you know like it it, it bypasses Oh, so the, I guess the example would be that uh, stealth doesn't get around seeing visibility. Um, oh, sorry, seeing visibility doesn't get around stealth. You know, if you cast invisibility and somebody is seeing visibility or two things, they'll just, oh, where's your man? How you doing? Uh, whereas if you stealth, then you get, get up and get their kidneys. Yeah, I think uh, it should be on the, the RPG writer to put a little bit of effort into that and say, does everyone have a role at this table? Does everyone feel like they can do something cool? Because if I, I think if you're building, you have people build characters and they can do nothing kind of cool or make them feel like, yeah, awesome. That was, that was, I think you need to look at it again. I think you're going, okay, this isn't, you need to give people a little bit of fun at the table, an ability they can flex sometimes. And even people who aren't very engaged in the mechanics feel rewarded by that and validated by their choices. And in game design, choices should matter. The fact that I picked a rogue or a sneaky character should matter to my ability to sneak around and do stuff. You know? And if it doesn't, by game design. That's what it comes down to. My only, um, my only worry, though, is that, you know, if we are pretty good thing where skills can achieve these amazing effects, well, amazing quotation marks, 
do you worry? Well, that's possibly a game design issue too. But do you worry about the what I'd call the crit fishers, the people who uh jump into roll the dice and just hope that they get like a, a, a seventeen or more and sort of force a DM to give them an amazing result that maybe they don't a hundred percent deserve. But you know that's sort of a game design slash. You know, let's crit be- fishing's a bad tactic. And bad tactics tend to lead to bad outcomes. If you if you make every failure consequence free, crit fishers are fine to keep crit fishing. If you start slapping some consequences on them, uh, the burned hand learns fastest. You know. So perhaps rather than say that we should be giving rogues uh, or super trained stealth people like more bonuses to their dice roll, yeah, they should have more control over the consequences. Exactly. Yeah, that, that that's I think is is possibly where we game design falls down is that it, we we're so focused on what the what number we get, but we don't say, well, someone who is level three in stealth can stealth in these situations that a amateur or a wizard can't, and t- doesn't suffer these horrible consequences. Yeah, I think that's possibly some uh, as your cotton your cotton servants library attempting to go into the command tent and pretend to be lost and get sent on your way as opposed to your cock invisible trying to get into the command tent so they hold you in a pen and execute you yeah i do, I do think there's there needs to be more thought on skill needs to be more than just a number it needs to cause something different to happen in, in a game uh, to really bring across that feds that you know this person has a magic thing that does a thing sure but this person is a professional. They do it better. Yeah. And try and get away from binary pass fail. Try oh, to get yeah, to a yeah, situation that's... where it's instead of that, it's no and, no but, yes but, yes and. Where it's basically like uh, you, can, you can, if you totally fail, it goes back, you fail and something bad happens. You could partly fail where it's you fail, but there is an advantage. Uh, you can partly succeed where you succeed, but there's a cost. Or you super succeed with a succeed and advantage. So you can try and get it into a situation where there where someone is getting they it makes it feel like their choices mattered when they decided to be good at self. And then also they decide to sneak in. And then also they did really well. They should feel like awesome. That was cool. I did something smart there. I accomplished a bunch of stuff. You didn't get into the tent, but you're in earshot, and it sounds like the general's taking orders from a mysterious individual. Exactly. Exactly. Alrighty. Uh, I think we've had a good natter around that, a good chew on that topic. Um, any final thoughts, Shane? A lot of it is going to come down to uh, GMs, and I think this is possibly where people say what people mean when they say "be permissive." Is this like not everything needs to be something you're skilled at? Just some people think in movie logic rather than in you know strict realism, and that's not a terrible place to have. Like. Be aware of the tone of your game, but also always lean on the side of letting people try something. You know, if the player is willing to risk the consequences of their role, that's 90% of the reason to let them take the role. Absolutely. Liam? Uh, Nothing more to add, really, no. I guess, um, yeah, nothing to add, really. Just just kind of discuss it all. Trying to think of of a witty closing thought or anything like that, but uh, coming up blank, so... All right, if any of the topics raised in this podcast have affected you, feel free to contact us on either our social media, our Discord page, or hell, yell at us in the YouTube comments. If there is also the speak pipe, if you actually, actually, actually want to yell, yell, you know, tell us why wizards should just be straight up better. Yeah, if yeah, the speak pipe, if you really want to give us, put us on blast. <laughs> but for now, this party's over. Thanks for listening to The Adventure Party. You can find show notes and links to things we've mentioned at www.theadventuringparty.net and on our Facebook page. You can leave comments there or talk to our Twitter account at AdventurePty or you can record a voice message at www.speakpipe.com slash theadventuringparty. We can also be contacted directly by email at party at theadventuringparty.net. If you like to be in touch with the party all the time, come join our Discord server. Link in the show notes. The Adventuring Party, released under a bit of comments, attribution, non-commercial, share alike, and version 3 license. <laughs>
<laughs> Nick was just giving out about how people keep doing that. I was like, we have this music. Why does everybody just insist on doing themselves? I so I did. Shane actually composed that. I'm. I'm I thought he did. Yeah. Okay. Wow.